Let's first just take a deep breath. And then I invite you to make that breath a prayer. That as you inhale, inhale, the spirit might fill you. And as you exhale, that you might be able to let everything else go. The spirit of God is here. The spirit of God is here to, to nurture and to remind that God is and that God is with us. And the spirit of God is here to speak to our hearts. Please join me in our call to worship. Whom do you seek? Jesus. Then call on his name. Sometimes he will speak through words or through music. Sometimes he will speak through others and seemingly casual conversation. There is no limit to how God can touch our souls. Sometimes God whispers in the silence. We would be blessed to hear a word from our Savior, but we come to offer our words of praise and thanksgiving. Yes, this is how to enter worship, with praise, with joy, for all that God has done and we trust will continue to do. Yes, let us worship the living God. And now let us, in silence, uh, open ourselves to the Spirit and let it, uh, Donald, thank you so much for ushering us into worship.
So on Thursday, it occurred to me that uh, we've had all very different weeks. And this was another, uh, and it came unexpectedly, the, uh, this storm. Uh, there, I've heard stories of folks who had to abandon their cars and walk home. Uh, lots of you uh, sore backs from uh, running your water vacuums in, in your basements and cleaning out and throwing out stuff. And, um, and some of you have lost your cars. And then uh, some folks have lost their lives this week. And we are sitting here in a sanctuary wearing masks and going into the fall. And it is a lot. And our normal order of worship is we come into God's gates with prayer and thanksgiving. Then we move to confession so that we can unburden ourselves, so that we can open ourselves to hear the word of God free and clear. There's nothing between us and God. Uh, but sometimes our worries uh, can also get in the way. So for this morning, it seemed appropriate to, to push up in the order of worship, the prayers of people, so that we can get all of that out, so that we can then sit and open ourselves to the word of God. Um, I, um, and the, the power of prayer, the, uh, I was thinking about one of the spiritual practices that happened for me during this last year and a half was uh, in part of a daily devotion is to read Psalms, uh, a Psalm every morning. And I'm like, why the Psalms? Why have the Psalms been uh, a comfort? Because one day the Psalmist says, oh, everything is right with the world, Lord. It is gorgeous. And I'm grateful. And thank you for everything. And the next day is, oh, how long, oh, Lord? Oh, please, really? I know, and the song, this is the, the songs, there's a formula there. I know you've been faithful to me in the past, and I know that you'll be faithful to me in the future, but Lord, hear my voice. Uh, that's life. Um, and I said, life is, you know, up and down, and it's also windy. Um, it's the days, I, I don't do those at the, at the, at the fairs, the, the teacup rides. I don't do the teacup rides, right? When you're doing two directions at once, and there are days that can feel like that. And where all you can do is just breathe and say, Lord. So, Lord, Lord, help. So let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, we come to you from all different places. Some of us just heard a lot of rain. We didn't lose power. And we're surprised to hear the, the next morning about the devastation for other folks. And the fear and for the ways that uh, folks try to help neighbor and sometimes successfully and sometimes not. Lord, we pray, I pray for everyone, wherever they find themselves spiritually, where their, where their heart is, where their soul is. And I just pray that your spirit might touch them and remind them that you are and that you are with them. And that you, one day at a time, Lord, we, that's all we can do, one day at a time trusting that, that you will give us what we need to meet the challenges of this day and every day. Lord, we are grateful to be in the midst of uh, brothers and sisters in Christ who are on this journey of faith. And, and when, we're, when we're real with each other, which I pray is most of the time, we're never saying it's easy. But it's easier because we have fellow journeyers who give support, who give shoulders to cry on, hands to hold, and that understanding, mm -hmm. yeah. And we know that we're not alone. We know that you are always and everywhere and there's no place that we can escape your spirit, but, it, but we are grateful for a family of faith, that you have made a family of strangers and cause to care for one another. And we're also grateful that your great call on us is to, to always be on the lookout for those who need to know that you are and that you are with them. 
Lord, we're going into to the fall and we are excited and to be able to teach kids about your love and at the same time when we're going to the fall where there's uh, we're not where we want it to be we were hoping to be able to go mask free and be on the other side of this and yet here we are so Lord give us again what we need to be able to, to face the challenges we pray for teachers we pray for students we pray for, for all of us at, at, and, and our attitudes. I was listening to a preacher this week saying his sermon last week was on, you know, the take it one day at a time and resilience. And then he said on Tuesday, I hit the wall. That's, that's how it is. Life has never been easy, but you have always been and will always be. Lord, give us the wisdom to meet the challenges of each and every day, looking to you, leaning into you to give us what we need to be not only faithful, but hopeful. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear all the ways that you're trying to bless us and to love on us, and then give us the faith to just proclaim it to the world. This is how I saw God today. Lord, we pray for all those who are mucking out their houses. For those who have lost, may they find. For all those who are mourning, Lord, we pray your peace upon them and also that you would surround them with people that remind them that they are not alone. Lord, we pray for for the fear in our hearts around COVID and the stories that we're hearing and the variants give us wisdom. And Lord, we pray for, it, it is so distressing how all of you know, public health has been politicized and we're all hearing different information. Lord, bring us together help you convict us that that's our work to build bridges. Lord, open our, um, our hearts to, to one another. Let us do uh, what is, is, is good for the common good. Convict our hearts. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, how you would have us go, and help us to come out of this together, more united. And it seems that seems like a crazy prayer, but that is your hope for us. That is your dream for us. That is your vision for us. And that will only happen if we commit ourselves to it. Forgive us, Lord, the way that we uh, vilify people who disagree with us. We make enemies of friends. We listen to voices telling us what other people believe rather than listening to those other people. Forgive our laziness and our apathy in the face of division and strife. And convict us that we all can make a difference. We can choose to build up or to tear down with our words and our actions. Lord, hold us accountable. Lord, we are grateful for, um, again, for the connectional uh, system, for brothers and sisters near and far. And we are mindful of the fact that even you know, there's great, great division in the church, but one Lord, help us to look to you. Lord, we lift up the prayers of, uh, of your people and, and the folks that we know in our hearts who need to know that, who need healing of some in one way, shape, or form, which includes all of us, of course. But Lord, you keep all of us. You know everything. 
Lord, we pray for peace of body, mind, and spirit for Dorothy and Ken and Mercedes and Gail, for Jackie and Ellen, for Irene and Jaquan, for Gladys, for Curtis, for William and Paul, for Pedro, for Yvonne's mom, for Sydney, and for the people that we name in our hearts. Lord, we pray for those in the country who are threatened by wildfires and those of us who have experienced flooding. For those who uh, in, in New Jersey suffer damage from tornadoes. Lord, we pray for the people of Af Afghanistan, for the divide that had to handle it. Um, political fallout, refugees, all of that, Lord, we lift up to you. And Lord, we are grateful for a Labor Day weekend where we are reminded that um, the importance of a Sabbath, the importance of hard work, but the, also the importance of taking a break and feeding our souls so that we can get back to work. Lord, we are grateful that we know that you are, that you love us, however you find us. Help us to grow in that love, to flourish. That through us, others might come to know you and know life. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray in one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So you are invited to stand in body or in spirit, and we are going to sing the Gloria Patri. <laughs> Screen. Holy God, Word made flesh, let us come to this Word open to being surprised. Silence all other voices but your own. Speak to us a word of truth, born of love, that anticipates change. Amen. Our unison scripture this morning is Psalm 146. We will read the entire psalm, 
that's up on the screen. Uh, it, it's a different version from the Pew Bible. So uh, please uh, uh, look at the screen for the text. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praises to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. By the way, our first hymn is going to be uh, Morning Has Broken, and the second verse is Sweet the Rain's New Fall. And I said, we're not going to sing that this morning. <laughs> Our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verses 21 to 28. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I know we can't do this, uh, but I would love to be able to ask you, who can do a Robert De Niro impression? Are you talking to me? Okay. So I know we can't do this now, but if you've got one, and everybody's got one, right? Please, at the end of the service, do it for me in the back when you say goodbye. Because, you know, that, you know, and this, this is where my mom Alan comes out, because you know, every, you know, and by the way, I've never seen the movie, but on YouTube, you know, I've seen the clip on YouTube, are you, are you, are you talking to me? And he just, and, and, right? Why, did, why does that come up? Because couldn't you write that into the scripture passage, right? Jesus says to this woman, you know, it's not right to give the, the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Couldn't you see her say, are you talking to me? Right? But she doesn't. But what do we do with the fact that I mean, Jesus uh, ignores her and then lays down the law and then drops this bomb? What do we do with that? Let's back up. Now, if you want to open your Bibles to Matthew 15, you can, but... This is just to say, in order to make sense of this passage, you need to know what's gonna, what comes before and what comes after. So you can trust me. <laughs> or you go, oh, there it is. Oh, there it is. It's up to you. Jesus has just been taking on the scribes and the Pharisees, the uber-religious folks, saying, you know, some people, and this is De Niro too, some people say with their mouths, that they love God, but their actions speak very differently. 
And by the way, we're all going to squirm with this passage. We always do. And then he says, it's not what comes out of your mouth that matters. It's, you don't, no, it's not what you, it's not what you put in your mouth that matters. It's what comes out of your mouth that defiles. I preached on that last week, but didn't, didn't really sit too long with the simple, with the simple idea that we are accountable for what comes out of our mouths. Now, the stronger extroverts among us have a harder time, have a harder time of this because extroverts speak in order to know what they think. Introverts think in order to know what to say, right? There's a scale, there's a range. So if you're a really strong extrovert, you had to get really good at apologizing to people because you said something, ah, shoot, right? And the introverts tend to kick themselves in the butt because they should have said it and they didn't, right? But you can't, just, you can't go through life saying, I'm just an extrovert, right? We can edit, we can all edit. And we have to be accountable for what comes out of our mouths. And this is timely, and this has always been timely throughout any age, but it does seem like we're living in a very divisive time where people are having a hard time staying in relationship with people uh, with whom you disagree about things that matter. Uh, but I'm also, I also want to say I'm hearing recently just longing, longing to be reunited with folks. Like, I hate your politics, but I love you and I miss you. Help. We've been putting off this work, you know, rather than do the work of building bridges, people just, you know, what ended up happening is people just started building the, the getting into their, into their camps and building strongholds rather than, rather than build bridges. We're going to have to do the work at some point. You know, we could just go back to speaking about nothing that's important. You know, we could just talk about the, the weather and sports. But wait, if we talk about weather, we might have to talk about climate change. Right? And that's divisive. Sports, but wait, you want to talk about uh, athletes taking a knee? That's divisive. It's harder to find things that aren't going to disturb anybody. I am part of a couple gardening groups on, on Facebook. What can you argue about about gardening, right? Some new person to, to the group just asked the question, hey, everybody, what do you spray on your weeds? Right? You know what comes next? Somebody goes Roundup, right? And then boom, right? And then it's a, Roundup is a carcinogen. It's killing us. And then, some, then suddenly everybody's a lawyer. And that hasn't been proven. My son's a lawyer. And then, da, 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 da. And then you start reading case law. In, in, in the comment section. And then there's finally somebody goes, can't we all just agree to disagree? This is a gardening site and to be making it political and I don't know if I want to be a member anymore. All the time, right? But we would never argue about that at church, right? So can I tell you that in my last church, we had a spring, they call it spring fling and they uh, come together on a lovely day in spring and some folks would go into the church's building and do a, you know, just really deep clean everything. And some folks would be outside and you weed and plants and, uh, and what else? And, and, and mulch, right? And the head, head of buildings and grounds comes up, hey, Robin, would you be willing to spray this on the weeds in, in the parking lot? And I'm like, what is it? Roundup. And I said, I will get on my hands and knees and pull out those weeds if you'd like, but I won't use that. And he, and he just he goes, oh, you're one of those. And I'm like, yep. And he goes, I'll find somebody else. And then I'm like, make sure they wear a mask. <laughs> right? Even in the church. What do we talk about? Being part of the healing. Of the healing is our work. Being peacemakers is part of our call as Christians. The church with a capital, it's a C for you this way, right? Not, not, this is C for me. The, the church with a capital C, which is to say, you know, beyond denominations, you know, Catholic, uh, uh, Protestant, all of us, church with a capital C should be leading the way 
because they have so much experience dealing with, with conflict well. Well, we're the worst, right? We just keep making new denominations. We need to learn how to manage conflict. And we've been putting the work off. Let me just say this, and I know this for a, pa- for a fact, there are people of all political persuasions in the sanctuary as we speak. The folks that we demonize on Monday, you sat in a pew with them on Sunday. How is it that we can have such divergent views on politics and all worship the same Lord? I don't know. Only way to figure that out is to be in conversation and to listen, and to listen to understand one another, uh, and learn how to have conversations that keep everybody at the ta- in the room, at the table, looking at each other into one another's eyes. I've done uh, work over the years, I've trained in something called Healthy Congregations that helps uh, teach people how to do this, leadership in churches how to do this. Why did I start doing this work? Because I needed to learn how to do this. I come from a family. Most of us come from families that don't deal with conflict well. So I needed to learn how to do it and then pass that along. And how do you state what you believe? Take a stand, but still stay connected to everyone at the table. That's the goal. And you, I have seen, I have heard someone articulate beautifully what it is they believe. And then at the very end, they say, and if you don't agree with me, you're an idiot. How do you recover from that? You can't. Boom, conversation done, right? Christians, we are accountable for what comes out of our mouths because we represent Jesus wherever we go. And I also want to say we are responsible for what comes out of our fingers, too, when we type. In the name of Jesus, we need to learn to speak the truth in love. And what is our call? To love God, to love neighbor, and to love self. And it's not one out of three or two out of three. It's three out of three all the time. How do we speak the truth in love to one another? So Jesus is walking with the disciples in, in Tyre and Sidon, which is Gentile territory. The Gentiles were Israel's pagan enemies. And this woman, a Gentile, cries out to Jesus in faith, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. She acknowledges that she knows who he is. She has just said, Lord, son of David, which is to say, I understand that you are the Messiah. But Jesus ignores her. Modern ears think that, hear that, or read that and think, oh, God, I hate being ignored. Right? Have you ever, you know, you hate being ignored, right? Have you ever gone into any kind of um, office situation where there's a, there's a big counter desk in front of you and there's people sitting back there and nobody looks up, right? And you know that they know that you're there, right? And I'm, you know, standing there going, all you have to do is just pick your head up for a second and say, I'll be with you in a minute. Uh, Just let me finish this thought. And I would be fine. But when they just ignore you, then I have to edit. Right? But when I was researching this passage, I found out that disputes in Jesus' time were often brought into a public setting, like debates. And somebody would approach somebody else with with, with something to, to debate. And if the person engaged in the debate, then the crowd would get to decide, you know, who was right and who was wrong. But if you didn't want to engage in that debate, you would just ignore the person. And it was not considered rude. It's just like, not now, you know, just not doing that now, not up for that today, not going to do it, right? But it was not considered rude. It was considered acceptable. But this woman is so persistent that the disciples are like, Jesus, please, Lord, do something. And he does. He says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
Now, how does he say, how does he say it? You don't know. I mean, scripture doesn't tell, and you know, there's no, nothing to describe it. And he said it testily, like I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. <clears throat> was he apologetic about it? You know, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. I'm so sorry. Right? Or indifferent. Ever had that conversation where somebody's like reading a magazine, they don't even look up? Like, I was sent to the lost sheep of this. Oh, no. I was, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Oh, you're still here. Huh. Right? How did she, how did she, but she persists. And then she kneels down before him, or it could also be that she bows before him. Right? And Jesus had just said that faith, that, you know, if it's just words, there need to be actions with it. And she doesn't. She says, Lord, son of David, those are the words. And then she literally humbles herself before him. The action is there. And then he does something, says something totally offensive. It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. People have of faith have struggled with this over the centuries. How do we make sense of it? I'm going to give you three different ways. You, maybe you can come up with another one, but I'll give you three different ways that people have, have interpreted it. Interpreted it. I'm going to advocate for one, but pray on it. The first is he didn't mean it. He was just testing her to see what her response would be. What her, you know, have, have you ever been in a situation where you see somebody be really, really nice to get what they want, and then when they don't, they just turn nasty? So he, he does this to see how she's going to react, and she, she does well. That's one way. That's possible. Other people look at the Greek and, and say that the, the word dogs can really be translated as puppies. And who doesn't love a cute puppy, right? It's not that bad. She, he just said puppies. I find that one hard to believe. Another way is that God is using this woman to help shape Jesus's understanding of his mission. If you think about it, Jesus learned from rabbis growing up about the history of the Jewish people, the law, the, the Torah or the Torah, his parents may have told him, that, hey, you're going to be the Messiah. But what was their understanding of that? The spirit had to reveal to him what that meant. And the spirit could be using this woman to help Jesus understand that the biases that he learned growing up are not of God's making. That the good news of the kingdom of God are for all of God's children. To quote uh, Galatians 3.28, there's no longer Jew nor Greek. Slave nor free, male nor female, but all are one in Christ Jesus. When what Jesus said may have been acceptable in the world that he grew up in, but as he travels and ministers in the name of God, he learns that there is no cultural criteria for becoming a disciple of Christ. Everyone can sign up. And then the woman says, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then, I just think this is wonderfully crafted. Jesus answers, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. He, he acknowledges her humanity, a woman. She's gone from, from an object to a person, from a dog to a human being. He sees her. He hears her. He's been changed by her. Great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And then the next passage that we, that we didn't read, but it's there. It says that they passed along the Sea of Galilee back into Jewish territory. He taught. He healed. And then it says, and they praised the God of Israel. Right? The gospel writer is making it clear that the crowd now is, is, uh, includes not just Jews, but also Gentiles, because it could have said, and they praised God, period. But the gospel writer, and, they, and we talked a little bit about that last week, but all the gospel writers you know, uh, re reveal their truths in different ways. Here it is. 
that the, the crowd has become more inclusive. The God, they praise the God of Israel. So what are we to take from this? I think we're meant to ask ourselves, who are the dogs for us? Who are the people that you think you shouldn't waste your time on? Who are the people that fill you with disgust? Is it a race of people, another religion, an ethnic group, a political group, a gender? Until we see each other's humanity, we will continue to treat each other like dogs. And I'm not, and I don't mean pampered pets, right? I wish I were treated like my dogs. I'm talking treating people like things and not human beings, human beings that we are called to love. And maybe you know this quote by James Baldwin. We can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in the denial of my humanity and right to exist. And here's the thing, people of faith. We can't do this work unless we're doing this work. Our faith can bring healing to our souls and to our relationships and to our world if like Jesus, we are willing to listen and be changed and to honor one another's humanity. And I would like to throw out that, that a lot of the turmoil in the world right now is because we don't see or honor one another's humanity. May this message be a crumb that feeds the desire for restored relationships for thy kingdom come. May it feed the belief that change is possible. May God's word sustain us and commit us to doing the work, to doing our work. And in the end, to all, may all the glory go to God and to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In his name, amen. You are invited to stay seated. We're going to sing, there's a wideness to God's mercy, but we are singing it to the tune of, uh, for the bread which you have broken. So the the words are up there or um, in the bulletin. The affirmation of faith this morning is taken from a brief 
statement of faith. It is displayed on the screens. Let's begin together. <clears throat> we trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everything equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator, ignoring God's commandments. We violate the image of God and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation, yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forget the missing child, like a father who longs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. Well, you've certainly noticed how during the COVID period, which I hope at some point we'll be, called, we'll be looking at in the rearview mirror, has impacted how we do worship. And one of the things I'm most sad about is that we no longer pass our plate to receive our tithes and gifts and offerings. Yet we remain, um, we, we let this space remain because it's so vital that part of our worship have this peace to return to God in tangible form and in spiritual form. Um, the things that, that um, God wants to use through us to heal the world and to build this kingdom of heaven on earth. And so it's funny because we talk about presenting our tithes and gifts and offerings. But I was kind of breaking that down as I was trying to think about myself. And so we know a tithe literally means a tenth. Um, many of us take a tenth of, you know, what we earn in one form or another, committed, pledge it um, to, to, to causes, including the church, this church, and the work that it does. And then there's offerings, which are things above that, that tithe. Um, Thanksgiving offerings, food offerings, special offerings, and then there's gifts. And I was thinking, gifts is kind of like everything else, including ourselves, including our intentions and the work of our hands. And so as we sit in this space, which we keep for this very special purpose, I'd like you just to, to ponder not only maybe what you might have pledged. And, you know, we, some people give weekly, monthly, at the end of the year. And also um, the offerings. Maybe there's a Thanksgiving offering that bubbles up out of you or God puts on your heart to maybe give, give more to the food ministries of the church. But also the gifts. The gifts that God has given through the Holy Spirit to each one of us. And so maybe God could put in, the Spirit could put an intention on your heart to contact somebody. Maybe there's somebody that needs to hear an encouraging word that God could put on your heart or somebody that needs a prayer. But I just trust that the spirit of the living God can take our willingness to give what we have, what we possess, but our very selves, our words, the, the intentions of our hearts and use it for something beyond what we could, could imagine. And so may God, through the, through the power of the Spirit, do something among us today, because the Lord loves a generous giver.
provision and love for this dark, broken world. And we ask it in faith because of, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I think we're going to stay singing now. So let's stay singing now. Each and every day with all that we say and all that we do and know that the grace of God covers praise the Lord all that we say and do friends know that the God who knit you together in your mother's womb would die for you and did in the person of Jesus Christ and is with you in power and spirit this day and forevermore let us go in peace amen